occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi. So the Washtenaw County Democratic Party recognizes historic indigenous communities in Michigan and those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. Washtenaw County occupies land ceded in the 1807 Treaty of Detroit. We further recognize the ongoing relationship of dependence upon and respect for all living beings of earth, sky, and water. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. Thank you for being here. I want to say hello and welcome to all new people. Stand up. All you new people, stand up. <laughs> We are so glad that you're here. We want you to come every month. We want you to sign up and be on committees. I already captured one person to help Brian next time. <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. You want to quick say names and where you're from? Or if you're new to the area or just new to the party. Ivan, I'll start with you because you're the only name I know. <laughs> uh, my name is Ivan Osman. Uh, I'm originally from New York City. Uh, came here from Texas. Been here about three weeks now. So glad to have you. So glad to have you here. A refugee from Texas. Who else? <laughs> You're welcome. How about you? Hi, I'm Tiffany. I moved here in 2015. I grew up in San Francisco, and I live in the Erie District. Tiffany, welcome. I'm so glad you could make it to the party <laughs> this time. It's great to see you. Not you. I know you. Yes. Um, I'm Laura Watson. Um, I grew up here, but I was in Atlanta for about a year and then back. So. Okay, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We have so much for you to do. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Uh, Lauren Hoffman, uh, also from Ann Arbor. I uh, haven't been to a party meeting in probably a decade, so just coming back again. Well, it's so great oh, that you're sure. back. It's great that you're back. Thank you. Uh, I'm mean, Bartholomew, uh, currently uh, Rep. Carrie Rygan's legislative director. Um, I've lived in Ann Arbor since 2013, and then in Ipsy uh, the last couple of years, we're moving back to Ann Arbor. So glad you're here. It's, <laughs> my my fiance is a teacher at Skyline, so she wants to be here. So oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any, anybody else? All right, I want... Okay, all members of the board, raise your hands. The executive board of the Washtenaw County Dems. Mary's out there <laughs> waving your hand. Okay, so these are these are the people who run the party. We have um, four, for you new people, we have four statutory officers, chair, vice chair, treasurer, and secretary. Treasurer, vice chair, chair, secretary's not here. And then the rest of the members of, and then the chair of the Black Caucus, where Crystal's not here. Oh, oh, that's right, Crystal's Eastern. So Caroline is chair of the Black Caucus, and then the rest of the members of the executive board are co-chairs of the standing committees, of which there are nine, and these people really carry water. Um, so I want to say thank you to everybody who's doing so much work to make this party as great as it is. A special thanks to Eli Nathan, standing in the back there, and Loretta Codrington who are the co-chairs of the program committee. And we have been here since 8.30. And not only do people carry water, Eli carried in all that food over there. So thank you, Eli. It's really, really a, quite a nice spread. And Brian Greminger, who is an honorary, um, what, just an honorary everything, <laughs> right, who's, hand, who's handling our, um, our um, audio today and video streaming. So very, very nice to see everybody. I'm going to spend just a few minutes giving you an update about the um, business of the party. Um, so we started, this board was elected in December, and we've been, Didi, Didi's a new board member. Did you raise your hand before? Diane Michelle. Okay. Uh, we started um, in December just organizing ourselves, thinking about what should a county board be, and then in January, we started a very rigorous process of strategic planning. Um, as you all know, Washtenaw County is very, very blue, but we can always get more votes. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And Washtenaw County is so great because we swing the state. And when we swing the state, we swing the nation. So we cannot leave any votes on the table in Washtenaw County. We're also developing um, assets like the um, uh, miVoter.org. It's an electronic version of the voter guide um, that um, we can export to other, other neighboring counties. So that's something that we're looking to do um, as well. So every committee participated in the strategic planning process articulated goals for the next two years. Our term is two years. And then the, and then the uh, membership can elect another board. So we articulated um, goals for the next two years. You are using new tools for some people. Some people are like, hate the Google suite, but <laughs> some of us love the Google suite. And we have a really great sheet, you know, tracking all of the goals so that we are really um, clear about what we wanna do and clear about accountability to the Democrats in Washtenaw County. Um, for the first time, to my knowledge, we have articulated um, a vision and mission for the county party. And now we're working on values. So we'll have a mission, vision, values statement clearly spelled out on the website for the first time. And the um, people working on the values statement is a group of folks from the county committee not the board of commissioners, the county committee, who stood up and said, I want to work on that document. And we had our first meeting. Kathy was part of that first meeting. Was anybody else in this room part of that first meeting? It's a really nice group of people. Do you want to say anything about it real quick? Um, I'm a Democrat. I my values. And I think it's really, really Right. So that I think that was one of the most important um, observations in the first meeting, you know, because it's like it can be like easy to be abstract and vague about what the party is for, what why you're a Democrat. But the fact is that we're all Democrats because of our hearts, because of our values. And we want to put those out there as a strong statement of what we stand for, which is love and taking care of one another. So. So we're doing that. Um, I'd like um, Debbie Dingle's going to call in. She's stuck on a, the runway in um, D.C. You know, there's a lot of weather moving through, so she's going to call in in a few minutes. But in the meantime, I'd like to ask other electeds to step up and talk to us about what you're doing. Justin, you want to start? Sure. Let me come up there. Sure, sure. Come on up here. Is the mic on? Or... Well, I think so. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I hope there are people all right. Good. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be back in person. It's been what two years since we've had one of these yeah, in person. Yeah, more. I think three, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Justin Hodge. I'm the chair of the County Board of Commissioners. Just going to give you a brief update here. Uh, I know a lot of you are probably really interested in what we're doing with the housing and homelessness crisis. Uh, if you've seen, been following M Live or WEMU, uh, you know that there have been about 90 or so families that the county has been paying to keep in hotels as part of our winter sheltering um, program. Uh, if you've seen some of the inaccurate information out there, uh, it indicated that we were going to be removing people from hotels. That was not the case. Uh, we're extending, uh, continuing keeping families in the homes and are working to get people diverted. Uh, at my last, the last thing I've heard, about half of the families could be diverted. Uh, and we're going to continue working to hopefully make sure that we can handle all that before we run into issues with the hotels. Uh, part of the challenge is we're getting to graduation for all the universities around here, so there are already uh, a lot of hotel rooms booked. So we're working as quickly as we can to make sure that people um, don't end up back on the street. And we're working uh, on a longer term strategy to address the housing homelessness crisis. Happy to take questions about that. The other thing I'll throw out is we have three uh, boards and committees that we do appointments to that have uh, openings and they, I think they all close on the 7th. Um, one of them is the Building Code of Appeals Board. Uh, and we're looking specifically for a plumber. So if you are a plumber or you know a plumber, uh, have them apply so we can do an appointment there. We're also taking applications for our reparations advisory committee that we formed a couple months ago. Um, there are 13 spots open for that and they all represent different sectors. So take a look at that. And we are also doing appointments to the Criminal Justice Collaborative Council. There are three slots open for uh, individuals with lived experience and then one person that's from the general public. Uh, so take a look at that. And I think all those close on the 7th. Any questions from anybody? 
I'm curious about the Criminal Justice Collaborative Council and what lived experience means. Yeah, so we're looking for people that have either been formerly incarcerated or have had other interactions with the criminal legal system. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I'll also add that for um, our upcoming meeting on Wednesday, uh, we will be voting on a, a, a it's really a resolution that directs county administration to continue the work around keeping people hotel. So uh, if you look at our, our agendas already been printed, if you look at that, uh, you'll be able to see that item on there. The, the details, I don't think we're able to make the print, but you'll see it um, early next week. Justin, can you say a little bit more about the resolution? Yes, so we formed the committee, I think in February, and the goal of the committee is to, and it's not a short-term thing. So people are gonna work on the Reparations Advisory Council um, probably for years, and ultimately what they're gonna do is give a recommendation to the Board of Commissioners on how the county government may uh, engage in reparations. So this isn't recommendations on how, what the federal government should do or the state government specifically, what can we do at the county level? No, so, so you got to have a question from somebody. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, we got Zoom questions. All right, great. Uh, Hang on a second. Where families will be diverted where? Just in the midst of uh, we are looking at hopefully putting people into either shelters or some people have family members that they can go with. Uh, yep. Okay, is that thunder? You know what? I'm going to, Rob, can you hold on a second? Because Debbie's called in. So I'm going to. Congresswoman hold. takes priority. I can answer more questions. <laughs> right. We'll come back to the county business. Debbie, can you, can you hear okay? I can. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yay. Yay. Okay. I'm trying to get there. I've been at the airport since 4 a.m. Oh. I hope the weather is not too bad, bad. I'm getting a little nervous because it's getting windy here now, so. We've got, we just had um, a huge uh, burst of thunder just right right now as you, as, I, as you picked up. So hopefully I will get there, but I do want to be safe because there have been some really bad tornadoes. So hopefully I'll be in right. Ann Arbor by this afternoon. Safety first. Um, it's been crazy, and I'm really sorry I'm not there. I was looking forward to being live for the first time in a while, but um, it's been crazy in Washington, and I don't think there's any other way to say it. Uh, we've been doing bills that, uh, I mean, this week, we, we called it uh, polluters over people uh, legislation. They are trying to, the good news is the president will never sign it, and I don't think that it could pass the Senate. But they are gutting landmark bills, uh, quite frankly, ones that John wrote 50 years ago on uh, the National Environmental Energy Act, known as NEPA, which gave communities a right, known as the Magna Carta of environmental laws around the world. And they're trying to gut that and allow uh, drilling in all kinds of places. But it, I mean, it, they're really gutting clean water, clean air, clean uh, gr ground uh, laws and it, it passed. They wouldn't even take my amendments. They get rid of the green bank that I had established, I mean, that I had in the legislation and they just really don't believe that global climate's real. And they believe that oil and gas are critical for our future and our energy security. And I'm just going to say it was a long week. So, um, well, we need to be alert and be talking about these issues uh, and really making sure that our United States senators hold strong, which I know they will, uh, um, and look forward on that. Uh, we had the TikTok hearing. Uh, when I'm, I'm, uh, we don't have to, it's very hard to talk to a group when you're in person and I'm on the phone. Uh, I have not decided wh what I think about banning TikTok. Uh, I made me feel good that someone said I was one of the three members that uh, did a good job in asking questions and I'm sending up a follow-up letter. It will go out on Monday because I didn't want it lost in uh, the Donald Trump hysteria of yesterday uh, asking, he told, said to me under oath, he was sworn in, that they did not track, they did not use GPS to track people. And yet, if you read their privacy report of 2023 on their site, they say that they do. So I'm um, sending up a follow-up letter to that, which will be released on Monday. But people have asked me, do I think they should be banned? I feel very strongly that we need privacy legislation, which, by the way, I think the genie's out of the bottle already. 
but uh, I think it has to be across all platforms. I think people have no idea the kind of information they're giving out every single day, how it's being used, how it invades their own personal private security, how it impacts our national security, how people know too much about you from so many different ways. And I do believe we need privacy legislation. I think there's bipartisan agreement on that. We got legislation through our committee in a very bipartisan way last year. Mm -hmm. California blocked it because uh, they don't want federal legislation on this subject. And Nancy was speaker, so we're going to try again. But there are a lot of Democrats that think we should ban it. Republicans think we should ban it. And I'm, I'm struggling with what the right answer there is. And but not today, but I would be interested. Everybody knows how, I think everybody's got my cell or my personal email, what you think and issues we need to um, be thinking about. One of the other major assignments I have, which I did not ask for, uh, and when he came and asked me to do it, you know, I did it out of whatever, but I think it's gonna be the most important assignment I may have while I'm in Congress. Uh, the Republicans have established three select committees. One is the weaponization of, uh, of government, uh, which Jim Gordon is chairing. And Stacey Pesk gets the ranking there. And Jim is not getting, is that committee is not getting off the ground or being as effective as they had hoped, which is good news because they're really trying to destroy people. Uh, they established the Joint Committee on China, and at this time, they're really trying to make that a joint committee where Democrats and Republicans are working together. So that is, at the moment, I mean, Democrats are agreeing that's not political. And the one that's really political and people are out to try to destroy Tony Fauci, Republicans are Tony Fauci and Francis Collins. But the bigger problem is that People's trust in public health is being undercut. We're seeing more and more parents that don't want their children to get vaccines. That's why we're seeing the measles, uh, breakouts of measles, because people aren't getting their shots. And I think, I'm not getting, uh, I went to the University of Michigan at the last break we had two weeks ago, because I'm lucky enough to be able to use them as resources. Uh, and one of the infectious disease doctors told me there, he's been treating HIV AIDS patients for 20 years, and they are now stopping their protocols because Tony Fauci was connected to it. And he said to them, don't you trust me? I'm your doctor. And they said they don't trust anything Tony Fauci's done. And the president of the World Health Organization was at Michigan two weeks ago too, and he, I had spoken to some people over there and talked to them. But the, my biggest concern now is people's lack of trust in medicine and in healthcare and institutions. And we, people aren't going into public health. We have no idea how important public health is. And the, the dean of the public health school uh, said that that's exactly what the president of the World Health Organization had said in his speech. And I was at the dinner that the president was at later that night. And he talked to me about what a crisis it is and asked if we could meet in Washington. And what's really sad is that the Republicans don't respect the World Health Organization. We're, and they, we have to be very careful when we bring him here of who he meets with. We really need to worry about what's happening in this country in terms of people's um, lack of trust in institutions. But when we think about that lack of trust in institutions, what the real complications are of things like public health. So I, I think for me, that's I'm gonna fly back to Washington on uh, Thursday to interview the Republicans have decided that they're gonna start interviewing people. You, there's two ways you do hearings, you have public hearings, but. It, the way the January 6th committee is that you saw hours of testimony and the Republicans are starting to do that. And I'm willing to be the member that's in that room holding them accountable. So I'm going to fly in and back out just to make sure I'm not, we really have to fight for our public health officials and Tony Fauci and Francis Collins are good people and they're really out to 
that Republicans are out to destroy them. So that's probably the job that I think is the biggest. And then I would tell you all, I'm very concerned about this indictment on Donald Trump. I think we've got to let the system play out. We've got to believe in three separate branches of government. It, the Republicans and their people in all of our worlds, they live around us that are going to try to politicize this. And I, I'm just going to say, and I'm glad to answer anybody's questions. I'm trying to just be calm, not get into the politics of, and, I mean, the indictment hasn't even been unsealed. So we don't, we don't even know what he's been accused of, just for the record. But I say to all of you, please never underestimate Donald Trump. Uh, we did in 2016, and there are still very strong uh, Donald Trump supporters in Michigan. And even though we have a crazy, I shouldn't say this publicly, but she is a crazy Republican Party chair, that doesn't mean that they can't get organized and and get some things done. So I'll stop there, and I'm glad to answer any questions. Questions? Representative Dingle. What? <laughs> okay. All in office. Well, right. That's right. Loretta, uh, Debbie, Loretta asked, what's the good news? I'm coming home. I'm Yay. Home. Yay. I hope I'm coming home. I hope you so, know, too. It's, it's rough in Washington right now, but Joe Biden's doing a good job. So There you go. We, I didn't even get to the banks. The banks were two weeks ago. I mean, we're living crisis to crisis. Yes, but he, and the banks are stable, and people should feel confident that their deposits will be safe. And, you know, I think that his summit for democracy was good news. Yep, it that, was. That was really interesting. That was, of course, you know, the mainstream media doesn't pay attention to it, but it, that was brilliant. I think, I think Eli Nathans has a question, Debbie. Okay. Do you think we are giving enough assistance to Ukraine? No, military assistance. I, I think I, I worry for Ukraine. And by the way, I also, well, let me answer that question first. I don't. I don't think we could give them. Uh, we're where the president thinks we could be right now. We are standing strong despite a lot of Republicans trying to chip away at this. Uh, I, look, I've said to you guys before, I'm very worried about the world order, about the, the tension in the world right now. And just so, you know, Paul Whelan is now a sixth district member. His, he, his residence was in Novi and his parents live in Manchester. So we all own him and are going to love him, whatever part he is. And uh, I'm very concerned about Russia's latest move in arresting the Wall Street Journal reporter as a spy uh, and did a, uh, we had a, a classified briefing on Thursday. And I said, I mean, I'm very worried. It deeply disturbs me and I'm worried for the Wall Street Journal reporter. But we also, Russia is just, this Russia-China connection is very disturbing. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, look, I'm not saying it's a good or bad. I'm giving you facts. Kevin McCarthy is meeting with uh, the, the, the president of Taiwan uh, in California uh, next week. I think it's next week. Uh, and the Chinese have said if he does that meeting, they will consider that an act of, of they didn't use the word war, but war warned that there would be consequences. I think the Chinese meeting on Russian soil is a message and a warning sign. I, I think we're going into a new Cold War area, era. We need to keep Ukraine strong, but we need to be doing it with a coalition of um, other governments. And I, I will tell you, I am hearing from a lot of people that are like, we've got and I think that we're fighting for democracy everywhere in Ukraine, and I deeply believe that. But there are a lot of people that are concerned about uh, the, our own the people that are hungry and can't find jobs and don't have health care. And we do need to take care of people like that. And we've got, I mean, I could have started, I gave you the last week. I mean, just if you look at the bank situation and the uh, I mean, we are going to hit the debt ceiling. To, well, actually, people are saying don't plan on an August break because it looks like that's when it's going to hit. And we are in total non-agreement with Republicans about one, about what we do. But, I mean, we, this government cannot default. But 
we, we probably do need to cut our budget in some places, but not in places that they want it to happen. And that is going to be one of the most difficult and critical discussions we have in the next few weeks as well. I mean, it is not dull. Now, there were reports yesterday that there are signs that inflation could be uh, slowing. And that's good news. You know, and another thing that happened yesterday is the Treasury finally put out their rule on electric vehicles, which is good news and bad news. We need to keep looking forward on electric vehicles uh, and get get rid of the internal combustion engine, otherwise known as ICE. But there are some of you in this room, I suspect, I won't name names, that have talked to me about the affordability of EVs. Now, Joe Manchin put a... um, um, and had a provision in there that says we cannot be any more reliant on China. So that in order to be eligible right now, we've had a tax um, uh, credit that has lowered, has made the cost of an EV more affordable. It gave you a $7,500 tax credit. Well, what came out yesterday is going to make domestic EVs not, that's not going to be eligible probably for a couple of years which makes the EV not totally affordable. The companies are not making money on EVs right now because you know your money counts when you start to move into mass production. They're making their money on the, I I, I use acronyms, on the internal combustion engine. We've got put money into uh, both the bipartisan infrastructure Bill and the IRA, I prefer calling it IRA, the Inflation Reduction, to build out charging stations and to help so that people have confidence that they're going to be able to charge. Republicans cut, I mean, I don't think it's going to pass, but they eliminated a hell of a lot of money on that. And if you talk to people in California, they don't have the infrastructure and they're not maintaining the charges and people can't find ways to get uh, their cars charged. And 50% of the people in this country don't have garages. So we got a lot of issues. UAW elected a new president this past week. I think everybody here should expect that there may be a long UAW strike in Michigan this year. And I think there are good chances of a very long UP, a long Teamster strike against UPS. Buy your Christmas presents now. Oh, God. (laughs) Okay. There's your advice from Congresswoman Dingell for at least we can, we know we can act on. Any other any other questions for Congressman? Yes, I'm sorry. Remind me of your name. Oh, I'm Tiffany. Tiffany, a new a new uh, attendee. Isn't that great, Debbie? Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, regarding TikTok, I really appreciate your bigger focus on um, privacy uh, protections across all social media platforms. I think that's much more important um, in many ways. I'm also curious because TikTok <laughs> is such a major part of young people's lives. I'm wondering how the possibility, what is the understanding right now of how playing TikTok would affect youth engagement towards politicians and, and towards political engagement? Well, first of all, I don't use TikTok. So um, I actually forgotten that it was on my devices. I was paying attention four years ago because of someone, but we've been banned at the federal level from having TikTok on our devices. Um, so. Uh, I don't. I think if I, I, I honestly, I'm I'm very worried about the kind of data TikTok is. If they say that they're not that they're a separate company, that their Chinese company is separate from um, uh, the rest of the the company. I really don't believe that. And I'm also going to say to you, by the way, there's so much data that every one of you, and in, uh, uh, including me, have shared about yourselves in so many different ways that you have no idea how it's being used. And you think that your emails are private and just between you, that data is being mined. Uh, You know, I mean, I always give the story of uh, one of my staff had an accident in my car. I never communicated with anybody. I never did anything. I didn't look up car collision places, but when I took it in, the, they sent me the estimate and I started getting car collision ads within an hour of leaving that place and getting that estimate. So people have, you know, you know for, I do a lot of my own research as people know preparing for a hearing when I'm having, a, I was doing opioids and all of a sudden 
we were having an opioid hearing and I started getting drug addiction, you know, treatment ads within, you know, by morning. People have no idea how the data is being collected, what data is being collected. There'll be another app that you, that young people will be able to go to. I, I worry about free speech. I, I'm just, I'm really, really struggling. I do believe that we've got the issue on privacy though across all apps. And that is one of the biggest problems. I also really, the other thing, besides the fact that we worry about the data that's being collected, we also know, I mean, in this document, I just read a book about it in the last couple of weeks, which I'm glad to share with everybody, but of what they're, how they're writing their algorithms so that what this, what people are seeing in China about us and what our children are seeing about other people and where it is encouraging violence of different kinds or suicide or there's some pretty horrific stuff on TikTok and I do that very much concerns me too so you know we're going to have to figure it out but uh, I, if TikTok were to disappear another app will will I mean that, that's the world where we live in innovation and technology something would replace it but I do worry about free speech Okay. Thank you so much. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to close this section, Debbie. That's fine with me. Thank you. But I love you all. Bye. She loves us all. Bye. Thank you, Debbie. We love you more. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. I love Debbie. So you guys, just so all you new people and welcome. You want to say who you are? I'm sorry. I might putting you totally on the spot. If you'd gotten here earlier, you'd have been one of like many. Hi. <laughs> Uh, I'm the one who wants, uh, super happy you're here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> oh, we're so glad you're here. And I want to mention that after the after the meeting proper, Sharon, Sharon, who is co-chair of the membership committee, is would love to meet with all of you new people, all of you new attendees, to learn more about you, to see if you have interest in doing more with the party, because we have some committees that really need new blood. Um, so we've got great committee co-chairs, but we could use some more, you know, some more committee members. And Sharon is the bank of knowledge <laughs> about all that. So she'll be up here after, and I want you to talk to her. Uh, Kathy, are, are, are the speakers all here? Okay, let's spend a few more minutes with electeds. And I'm sorry, I did not ask electeds to stand up and raise your hands. Carrie Reingans just walked in, state rep. Hi, thank you. Who else, other electeds? And in a sec, Ellie, don't be shy. <clears throat> Ellie Savitt, county prosecutor. Who else? Celeste. Celeste. Where's, I don't see, I don't see Sheriff Clayton. Yes. Way back there. Hello, hello. Okay, okay. So Sheriff Clayton is here. Where's Ca Caroline? We've uh, Caroline's been recognized like a hundred times because she does so many things. <laughs> anyway, so Victoria, where is Victoria? There's Victoria Burton Harris, ass assistant, uh, a okay, chief assistant prosecutor. So and Annie. Annie Somerville, new county commissioner, who is killing it on the county board. I'm telling you, it's really impressive. Um, okay, Justin, you want to finish up with a, with oh, the oh, housing yeah. piece? Celeste. And Celeste Hawk, yeah, Celeste Hawk, where are you again? You were right there. I said, no, you're, you're kind of in hiding back there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if you have more questions about the, about the housing, housing stuff. Okay. stuff. I'm going to ask more questions. All right, go ahead. Which question? Yeah. Uh, would this job position be on the WCB website? No, so I'm talking about uh, board appointments that the Board of Commissioners makes to our committees. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The question was what website? Uh, did the things that I mentioned earlier. I'm still looking for a plumber, right? So we're looking for someone for uh, plumbing to be on, represent on our uh, building code board. Uh, talk about the reparations advisory council and uh, the CJCC. Yep. Any other questions? 
You got, why, why are you asking me a question? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Commissioner Sanders, what's your question? <laughs> just so people are more clear, can you just share with us the ways in which the public can reach out to us and ask us questions uh, so that they can get direct answers from us and not sort of cast aspersions of what ifs and myths. Misinformation. Yes. How, to, how to have the public not engage in dispersing misinformation. Yeah, so we've got uh, all of our contact information on the county website. You can go on there and click the, the pictures of us. Uh, we also had the clerk's office recently update that to add all of the different committees that we serve on. So I think a lot of people think the Board of Commissioners, we just come together on the first and third Wednesdays and then have like a five hour meeting and that's the only thing that we do. Not, it's not accurate. There's a lot of, that's like the little, the smallest part of what we do. So we all serve on a bunch of different committees uh, and then there's all the other work that happens in between. So you're, you can always email your commissioner, call us, the, our contact information is on there. Uh, if you, you're hearing something in the community and you want to make sure that you're getting the most accurate up-to-date information, just, just call us. Yep. Uh, Audrey Anderson was asking, how do you apply for the CJCC? Yeah, so it's on the same page as uh, all of our other appointments. If you just Google Washtenaw County Boards and Commissions, it'll take you to the page. Yeah. I could give you the web address, but I'm not going to recite a URL up here. It just wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> Anything else? That's it. And then I think there was another new person over here that, that we didn't recognize yet. Hi, I'm Jessica. Uh, I lived in the county for a long time, grew up in Milan. Um, I'm living here now. I'm in Justin's class. Oh, awesome. Semester, so Welcome. We're so glad here. you're here. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Anybody else knew that we didn't recognize? Chris Watson, no. Ann Arbor City Council. Oh, we didn't applaud Chris. Oh, we didn't applaud. Oh, my God. <laughs> Just hid while we were talking about elections. Love that. Appointed, but we do. You're still the road commissioner, right? Okay. So Barb Fuller. All right, Barb Fuller. The road commissioner. Thank you very much. Chair of the road commissioner. Chair of the, Chair of the, road, of the road commission. And I will tell you, um, I've learned from Barb recently in conversation about the unbelievable amount of work. The road commission, who knew the road commission has done to make sure that we have actually have high speed Internet access everywhere in the county. That's that was the road, that's, not the road. that's a different thing. That's the broad. Well, that's what I wonder. That, what was, what the was, the broad broad that was the broadband task force that Barb also chaired the broadband task force. Chair the broadband task force. Yeah. Very impressive. Incredible work. So everybody say hi to Barb and thank her, you know even now before your internet comes through, <laughs> because it's really incredible. Also, Barb's been really um, active in the um, Western Washington Dems. So that's fantastic. And Carrie, you know, so it's really easy. Google County Board of Commissioners or just County Board or, you know, and you will be able to contact your commissioners very readily. They're very accessible. Same with, you know, your city council. Carrie, what's the, what's the best way to find you and other state electeds for you, folks? Uh, because sure, I come on up. was on Zoom and I noticed that that cam that mic is connected to Zoom, right? Yes. Yes. So when yes, people good. speak, they should speak in this. Mic. Yes. Yes. So um, the best way to contact your state representatives and your state senators are go to each of the um, chambers main websites and look up by your address who is your um, representative or senator and then contact them through their email box or call their office or just go to our office. You can just go to our office. You can go to the House office building and the Senate buildings, and you can walk in, sign in as a guest, and they will tell you which room number is your representative or senators, and you can just go there. So you can go in person, you can call, you can email. Um, and some are more responsive than others on social media, but we do try. So um, you can also try that method too. And last word from your sponsor, Will, um, you can also talk to your electives by coming here every month on the first Saturday of every month. Occasionally, it's not the first Saturday, like if it's July, it won't be the first Saturday and so forth. But our intention is that, you know, electives are always invited and our intention is to have at least the first half, half hour of the meeting, just open time with your electives and each other. So. All right. Can I say one more thing before we start with the <laughs> county stuff? Since internet got brought up, uh, so I know there's been a lot of concern about what are we going to do 
uh, related to making sure that everybody has access from a financial perspective, since a lot of the work that we did, I think it was $14 million or so that we allocated to making sure that we lay down the physical infrastructure to make sure every home in the county can get access. For families that uh, maybe don't have access to devices uh, or the funds to be able to pay for internet, we also allocated uh, a fund for that. So we're, uh, this is probably a little bit of news for the other commissioners, early conversations around some of our uh, digital equity work. Um, so more on that soon, but we haven't forgotten about that. We did allocate a significant amount of money to make sure that we can get everybody uh, access in, with devices and access to the internet. That's it now. I think that's it. Yeah. All right, thank you guys. All right, now the next face you see at this podium will be Sheriff Terry Clayton. Will we be able to have time for emergency? Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Okay. You don't have to be Jerry. I'm sorry, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, since no other uh, legislators are here, I just wanted to give folks a quick update uh, of our freaking sprint of a first three months um, in Lansing. So as you know, after last November, the House and the Senate are both now Democratic majorities um, for the first time in 40 years. And yes, thanks, thanks in part to all of you um, donating, knocking doors, uh, talking to your friends, getting out there and voting. So we left uh, very few votes on the table. And that resulted in the seven um, House districts, six of which are in Democratic hands here in Washtenaw County, and our two Senate districts in Washtenaw County are also um, represented by Democrats. So uh, in our first three months, we have passed our first six bills um, and had them all except one is signed into law so far. Um, that would be repealing the retirement tax, um, restoring the earned income tax credit, which we're calling the working families tax credit, uh, back to 30% of the federal level, we have um, uh, repealed the so-called right to work for public and private employers. We have restored prevailing wage on state contracts. Uh, all of those have been signed into law, as has been the expansion of the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, which is adding um, sexual orientation and gender identity and expression into our state's civil rights law um, for the first time. And this has been something that's been worked on for 50 years. And so it was finally done because we have a Democratic majority and a Democratic governor. So thank you to all of you good Dems for having that happen. Um, that was signed into law earlier this month. Um, and then we repealed our 1931 abortion ban which was unenforceable due to Prop 3, which is also heavily influenced by all of you getting your butts out there and doing all the work. Um, so thank you for that. And that one will be signed soon. Um, and then we're also working on our three big gun packages. Uh, they've all passed the Senate and two have passed the House. The three big gun packages revolve around requiring background checks for every gun purchase, uh, storing safe storage in homes with kids, and establishing extreme risk protection orders where a judge can make an order that um, firearms are removed temporarily from somebody with uh, an intent to hurt themselves or others. And that one has not yet passed the House. We're still listening to um, law enforcement because we want to make sure that we're keeping folks safe. If this is their job to go confiscate um, firearms from people, we know for sure they have a firearm. So it is a risky situation. So we really want to make sure we're taking that into account. Um, so those are things that are uh, being worked on. And then when we get back after our in-district working period, which is the last week and next week, um, we will be really focusing on our budget. So those are just a couple things right. for everybody to know about. We are still sprinting. We're going to keep sprinting because we don't know how long we have the majority. Um, and then just for uh, me, from my office specifically, um, I have two constituent contact hours coming up on April 15th. It's a Saturday. We will have a coffee hour at White Lotus Farm in Sio Township. It is a great place for kids. So if you are a person with kids that are of like walking age or um, above, my daughter would happily play with your kids. So parents who like feel like you can never go to things, bring them to this one. Um, and then um, on Friday, April 21st, for people who don't like coffee, I'm having a happy hour at Holmes Brewery, also in Sio Township, or Holmes Campus. It's the one on Jackson Plaza, Holmes Campus, um, in the afternoon from 4 to 5.30. But right after that, I'll have a fundraiser to toast the first 100 days of this legislature. So um, come if you're a constituent. Come if you just want to toast Democratic majorities doing good stuff. Um, but uh, we'll be sending out information on social media. So. And do you want to take questions for oh, a couple minutes? I'm I mean, happy to take fun. questions. This is a really friendly audience. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. and then on Tuesday, that is coming up Tuesday in three days. 
we will have a um, celebration here locally in Washtenaw County of the signing and passage of the El Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act awesome. expansions at North Star Lounge, uh, which is in Carytown in Ann Arbor. And I don't know the exact time, but it's evening-ish, five at five. Thank you, Annie, for knowing the things. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna write, I'll write down on the yes. board. I don't um, go, I'm not trying to crowd you. I just wanted to uh, say that you can take questions. Yes, any other questions? Any from online? Um, not a question. This is just a reminder to Teresa to plug the table concert. Oh, thanks. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> I wonder who that came from. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, before I do that, I, I, I am in awe of our legislature and so thankful for our legislature and all of the work we have all done to, to, for that trifecta. In fact, quad fret, quad fret, <laughs> because we got the Supreme Court as well. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. So how exciting. So thank you. Uh, Lansing's working so hard. And by the way, there'd be a lot more electeds here today if, if it weren't spring break for everybody. So yes, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Come to the, uh, come to, I wanna say Elliot Larson, come to the Louis Nagel concert. Um, it's one of our biggest fundraisers of the year. We need you to participate. It's you can either um, come on, you know, it can be Zoom, like we're doing here, or you can come in person. It is Sunday, April 23rd from 4. I think it's at 4. Michael Cohen remembers. It's at 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And for the first time, this is a third annual Louis Nagel concert. He is an internationally known concert a pianist. Um, and he is donating his time. Um, and talent for our benefit. So please come and sign up online. And for the first time, we're able to also have an in-person option. Um, so we're gonna have cheese and crackers and we can uh, chat with each other and with Elliot, uh, Elliot, sorry, why do I keep saying Elliot? Cause the Elliot Larson is in my head. With Mr. Nagel, who is just an amazing and charming person. And I feel like, that, oh, and Alyssa Slotkin will be introducing um, uh, uh, El Lewis Nagel. Um, so, and we all love Alyssa Slotkin. So, all right, so come on uh, April 23rd. I'll put that on the uh, board and I'll put this, the Elliot Larson thing on the board. Okay. All right. You want to take a few minutes. We expect you back though. Um, just a few minutes while the, while the panel sets up and um, then we'll get going with the program part of our program. Right. Okay. Hi, my name is Loretta Codrington. And I want to welcome you guys too to our uh, first in-person meeting for a very long time. It's so good to see all of your faces. We appreciate you being here, um, and thank you. I serve on the uh, uh, programs committee with my illustrious partner Eli Nathan, who's here someplace. Eli, where are you? Oh, there he is. Okay. Um, and so I just want to uh, say thank you again for you guys being here. I want to introduce our panelists, our wonderful panelists here who um, are going to be discussing a very important topic that um, is near and dear to all of us. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce, and when I do introduce you, um, just raise your hand or stand up. Uh, our first panelist is Derek Jackson. He's the Director of Community Engagement for WS, WCSO, and he's leading the work for the, um, for the CVI. Um, next, we have Brian Foley, and uh, Brian Foley is the Vice President of Supreme Felons and also a member of uh, the Community CVI, doing Community CVI work, and they will explain that to you in just a moment. More than I'm already speaking up? I'll get closer to the mic. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Perfect. <clears throat> Is that better? Yeah. Okay. And next we have Ryan, I'm sorry, Roger Roper. And Roger's from We Live. We also have uh, Justin Hodges, who we also met earlier today. He's our county commissioner. And then we have Ellie Savitt, who's our county prosecutor. 
Did I forget Billy Cole? Yeah. I did. <laughs> Billy. It was a distraction. I'm so sorry. Billy is the president of Supreme Felons, and um, they each will, again, uh, discuss what that is. But I also want to introduce my co-moderator, who everybody knows, Sheriff Clayton, who um, is here to moderate, and I'm going to take a back seat and let him take over. So thank you guys for being here. I'm Loretta Codrington again with the Programs Committee. I hope that somebody will join our committee because we also are looking for people. All right, good morning, folks. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you, Loretta, for setting this up. Um, no, go, go Okay, forward. sorry, guys. I forgot one thing. So if you have questions, um, I want you to raise your hand, and uh, my co-partner, Eli, will bring you a card so you can write the questions down, and then we'll hand those to, uh, to, to the share. Okay? Thank you. All right. So we have a lot to discuss in a short period of time, so we'll get – right to the point. I'll just sort of lay out what our format's gonna be for today. Uh, I'll just do a few introductory remarks, just sort of framing the discussion. And each one of our panelists will have five minutes, five minutes to, to really share with you um, the work that they're doing from their perspective. Uh, during that time, if you have questions, feel free to forward the questions uh, on the index cards or if it's via uh, Zoom, we'll get those written down, they'll be handed to me and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Fair enough? Yeah. All right, let's rock and roll. So again, uh, I want to show my appreciation to uh, the Washington uh, County Democratic Party for having this conversation. So this whole issue of community violence is not only a national issue, it's an issue in Washington County, right? It's an epidemic that we, we have to think about how we navigate this as a community. Um, Great panel occupying different spaces to give us uh, some perspective. But before we start the program, I would respectfully ask that we observe a moment of silence for uh, in remembrance of all those in Washington County and elsewhere that's lost their lives to community violence. So if we can just do that. Thank you. So much of the work that's you know currently being performed in, 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 in this space continues to evolve around evidence or evidence-based approaches that are being advocated nationally. And there's one thing to think about evidence-based. I always argue at some point somebody has to do it first and then measure it for there to be evidence to continue the work. So in many aspects, you have to lead. And in Washington County, there's some leadership going on where they say, well, well where's the evidence that shows this has worked? What we'll say is there's, there's there right now, there's qualitative evidence. There's evidence that we know there's anecdotal evidence. There's evidence that we're getting from folks in the community that retaliatory violence didn't occur because folks that are occupying this space that'll speak to that has actually entered the fray, put themselves in harm's way and stop things from happening. But we're also working on measuring the actual impact of the work that's going on here. Um, and I wanna just frame what Washington County's doing around one report. So there was a report that came out in April of 22 by the Joyce Foundation. And those few folks can look that up, print it off. And the, the work that it was titled uh, Toward a Fair and um, Just Response to Gun Violence. And that group convened over three years. And you had a lot of experts. You had researchers. You had people uh, that were doing their community violence work. You had elected officials, both from just a governmental representation standpoint and law enforcement coming together and said, look, we have to come up with a strategy, a comprehensive way of addressing this. And I just wanna to speak to some of the recommendations that came from that. The first recommendation that came from the report is to increase public investment in community violence intervention, improve coordination of funds for community-based programs. So the experts say on a national level that from a community standpoint, you must be, be intentional and deliberate about investing, structurally investing funds in this work. Now, I'll just back that up by saying the governor, Governor Whitmer, also has in her budget over $30 million allocated for community investment work. It's part of the Michigan Safe Community. So not only are they investing in police services 
and police work, but they've also found that you must invest where you have people with lived experience actually doing some of that work. So that is going, and the, and the state is putting together uh, an Office of Community Violence uh, Intervention. So that is going down, down the track. And we all know too, as part of uh, President Biden's Build Back Better and some of the other things that have gone on, that there's been significant investment in community intervention work. So that's part. The second recommendation is to increase the professionalism of the field of community violence and intervention and prevention. So there's a recognition that we have people occupying this space and they're just doing it based on their instincts. They're doing it based on the fact that, hey, I've been there, done that. I've either been a victim of violence or quite frankly, I perpetrated violence. And you know what? Those two things are inextricably connected. Oftentimes, people that are victims of violence perpetrated and vice versa, because we know over 80, 85% of the gun violence in this county is retaliatory. <clears throat> so they're doing it out of instinct, but there's a recognition that, you know what, we must professionalize uh, community of uh, uh, violence intervention specialists. We have to create training. We have to create um, um, policy, procedure, operational protocol to really have the kind of impact that we have. And guess what? Part of that happens when you have communities like Washington County that's, that, that, that goes into the fray and does that work, analyzes that work, evaluates that work, and then you start to create best and promising practices. And that's what we see. Three, treat violence, community violence intervention is a public health um, intervention, that we cannot separate those two things out. That we have to think about how does public health address disease in community, and we must go in that same direction as it relates to this issue. And finally, create or expand, they call citywide offices of violence prevention. In other words, not only should government invest in community-based interventions, but, community, but, but, but communities should actually create, as part of their local arm of government, intentional offices that help support this work. So you can't roll out the other three recommendations unless, as a local community, you actually set the architecture in place to ensure that these things occur. So I'll end with that. Just I want to just frame what is going on. That report was one of the reports that was used in one of the latest briefings to the White House around community violence intervention. And I would assume that that report will continue to be used along with other reports to help the president at a federal level think about how we do this and we know that that should influence local politics. All right, so enough of that. So <clears throat> I wanna be respectful of our, of our elected officials and I wanna start the process that way with our elected officials giving their, their spiel, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the folks that are actually on the ground. So if I may, I'd like to turn it over to our chair of the Board of Commissioners, uh, Justin Hodge, to talk a little bit about sure. the work that they're doing. On the table, share them. Uh, they are the Zoom attendees, so you'll have to continue to speak loudly. Okay, is this taking up on Zoom? Yes, it is, all right, great. So I'm gonna talk briefly about the county's investment in community violence intervention. Uh, I want to start off by also thanking uh, current state Senator Sue Schink. She really partnered with me on a lot of this work when she was chair of the board last term. Uh, so you may be familiar with the Community Priority Fund. That was a fund that we created using some of the American Rescue Plan dollars. Uh, and one of the components of that was identifying programming in the community that we wanted to support uh, that was related to community violence intervention. Uh, the way that this the community priority fund worked was that each of the commissioners that represents a portion of the 48197 and 48198 codes got to appoint one community member to the group to review all the applications that came in. They scored them and then they gave the recommendations to us. Uh, so I, I represent um, one of the, that large portion of that zip code. Uh, and I also live in a neighborhood that's uh, one of the ones that's more affected by gun violence. So uh, as an outcome of the community priority fund and the recommendations made by the community members, we ended up allocating a about $2 million or so to community violence intervention work. Um, and the organizations that were funded by that were Supreme Felons, A Brighter Way, Dispute Resolution Center, and then there were two other organizations that uh, the community reviewers didn't think were, they needed some technical assistance. Um, so they worked with the county to get their application uh, better and improved it. And then we also allocated funds to them. So that's Washington, My Brother's Keeper, uh, and We the People Opportunity Farm. So we wanted to be able to really support the people on the ground doing that work. Uh, and as the sheriff mentioned, it's evidence-based. There are many other communities across our country that are doing it. NPR just did a segment the other day uh, talking about that. And this is an ongoing commitment uh, by the county to do that. We are also planning to do um, an asset map and figuring out what resources exist in the community um, so we can approach this more strategically. 
I think Derek, when we get to him, we'll talk about the community violence intervention team. Um, one of the outcomes from that group was developing 14 recommendations on how to combat community violence. And the Board of Commissioners, uh, we voted, it was last year that we voted to accept those 14 recommendations and to do our part uh, to move forward on that. And that was a component of us doing that uh, roughly $2 million allocation uh, and then stepping up in other ways to continue the work. Because this is not just going to be a one and done thing for us. Uh, we're really focused on continuing to do that. And I also want to point out that uh, recently our our board of Health, we have a Board of Health member over there, uh, we voted to, uh, as the Board of Health, so the Health Department, uh, accept those 14 recommendations too. And the um, Board of Health had already voted to acknowledge that gun violence is a community health, a public health issue. Uh, so it's not just the Board of Commissioners, it's also our Health Department. County government is approaching this uh, as something that's critical for us to address, uh, and we're doing it in an evidence-based way, in a way that also uh, respects public health. So I'll turn it back over. Thanks, Chair. Appreciate it. And then next, we'll go to our uh, county prosecutor, Ellie Savage. Ellie? That, thank you. Is this, this on? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so in my line of work, we are fundamentally reactive to gun violence. And, you know, when a case comes across our desk, we prosecute it, we go to trial, uh, you know, and, and we have some great attorneys working for us and, and we get convictions, but that at its core, it's hard to celebrate when you're talking about gun violence and especially somebody that's lost their lives because you still got somebody dead, right? And now you've got somebody who's going to prison probably for either the rest of their life or very close to the rest of their lives. And it's the best we can do in a reactive sense, and it's our job, and we have to do it. But like real justice, what really we should be focused on is making sure that that doesn't come across our desk, come across law enforcement's desk in the first place, and that that shooting does not occur. It's imperative when you're talking about prevention, uh, and you'll you'll hear from you know the, the the folks on the panel that people that are in the community that are doing this work be credible, be tied to the community, uh, and be able to get into that fray and interrupt violence before it happens. We can't just rely on law enforcement and prosecutors on the back end, because the truth of the matter is, here's United States Department of Justice statistics, right? The absolute majority of crimes in this country, according to the United States Department of Justice, is a nation, national issue, are never reported, right? So if we don't even hear about the crimes that happen, it's not like people are going to be calling up law enforcement, calling up prosecutors for what's brewing, for that retaliatory cycle. And that's why it needs to be led by the community. It's why the community uh, and folks with, who are credible and who are able to get involved here in sort of a rapid response way uh, have to be leading on this. And I'm really grateful that we have a county where this is going on. I can tell you from like the, the, the homicide reports that, that, that I read, you read these reports when they come in from law enforcement and there's so many of them and it's often young people where you're just reading the report and you're just, you just say, God, that choice that you made, that one decision when you asked to go get a friend's gun, right? And you went back because you were mad at somebody. And now somebody's dead and you're facing murder charges. That second, when you decided to do that, those minutes where you decided to do that, that's the point for intervention. That's not something that prosecutors can intervene in. It's really not often something that, that, that anybody that's institutional can intervene in. But that's the work that these guys are doing. It's going intervening at those crucial points and making it so those reports don't cross our desks so law enforcement isn't called in the first place. The nature of this work, honestly, is that like these guys prevent tragedies from happening. And it never makes front page news when somebody doesn't pull the trigger on a gun, right? You never hear about it, but that's success. That's more justice than we can ever hope to get in the court system because just means that somebody is alive, is still with their family, and that somebody else isn't facing the possibility of life behind bars. That's this work. That's why I'm very proud to support it. And that's why I'm so grateful for everybody on this panel for the incredible work that you're doing. 
Thanks, Ellie. Well, well said, well said. Uh, I'd like to go to our director of community engagement, uh, Derek Jackson. Derek will talk about, you know, not only the work that happens in our space, but more importantly, the work that happens in a larger space, because it does start with community violence interruption. Derek? Yeah, and I too am thankful that the party is actually having this conversation, and partly um, because our party at the state, federal, county level, Gabby Giffords were here. I know a lot of you went to hear her speak. If you go to her website, this very issue is one of her top priorities. So it means a lot to our party, right? Our party believes in redemption. Our party believes in social justice. Our party believes in equity. And these are all things that you'll hear here as we continue to talk that's all roped up into this. But I'll just say that, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood where, honestly, um, I thought it was normal for people to know someone who had been shot or murdered. It wasn't until I came to Washington County and I came to Eastern that I realized, oh, that's not normal. And I start with that because I just saw Dr. Marquez at, uh, from the Public Health Department showed a map of the 15 zip codes in Washington County. And it listed and layered over in the last 12 year, 11, 12 years, um, how many homicides they had had. And out of 15 zip codes, uh, eight or nine of them have not had a single homicide in well over a decade. So for the folks who live in that zip code, this conversation sometimes is like out of, the, out of this world. It doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. And I can just tell you as someone who grew up in an environment like that, um, I understand the violence that is happening at a very, very um, core level, right? And so the work that I get to do, thanks to Sheriff Clayton, um, and helping to convene the CVIT, the Community Violence Intervention Team, is not something that is just taken lightly. It's literally about saving lives. And you're going to hear from the folks. I get to talk about it, but they actually do the work. So you're going to actually get to hear from them. But I wanted to start with that because the conversation we're having in this room, but also across our county, for some folks, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. They don't know what it is like to hear gunshots or to actually know someone who had been murdered, um, or in a certain community where uh, out of 100,000 people, the rate would be um, 70 to 80. 70 to 80 people out of 100,000 folks in a particular zip code here in Washtenaw County, if it was that large, would um, be murdered. In a county like Washtenaw that has so much, so many beautiful things and one of the best places to raise your kid, there are pockets of significant violence that a lot of times gets overshadowed. So in August of 21, uh, at the time, it was Mayor Richardson. Uh, we were all at a, a distribution event, handing out supplies for COVID. And we had had two young people who had been murdered in close proximity to one another. And she just wanted us to talk. And that first session, I'll be honest, was like a grieving session. We were just in there thinking about another young person that we all know and work with. But the conversation was so good, someone suggested we come back next week and we talk about solutions. And for 15 months, and many of you go to a lot of meetings, for 15 months, we did not miss a single week. It was every Tuesday at one o'clock and we still meet all this all these months later. And what we were doing was elevating community voice, those who have been most impacted, mothers who had lost a son to homicide, uh, young people who have been shot, those who had pulled the trigger um, and gone to prison and now are out redeeming themselves, elected officials like Justin and Sue Shink uh, around the table. And we were reading this book called Bleeding Out. We were learning from national experts. They were joining our Zoom calls. And we were slowly but surely educating ourselves from the inside out and outside in. And then we developed this report with those 14 recommendations that Commissioner Hodge and them um, uh, have, have kind of put into practice. And now we're asking everyone to really look at those. And why I think that is important is it seems hopeless, but there are solutions. It really does seem. I'll give you, I'll give you one, because I promised the kids when we talked about this, we would always bring this up. For years, the kids have been saying, we need a community center or a safe place or something to do in eastern Washington County. In the Ipsy area, there's nothing for us to do. And now when we started doing the research around the country, for any community that has actually tackled this issue, they have actually a physical, safe space for kids and families to come together, to get to know one another. And so it's really important. So guess what? Now there is a serious conversation. Not just, well, we got some money here and there's some land here and we should think about doing it, but then politics gets involved and it never happens. But we've been doing that for 20 years, three iterations of plans with money and land that didn't come to fruition. Now it's actually gonna come to fruition because it's not just fun things for kids to do. Something like that could literally save a young person's life. 
And I can say that without a doubt, because in my neighborhood where I grew up in Inkster, when they put the recreation center there, that was the one place we could go on a regular basis to get off the streets. So I can feel the sheriff beaming at me because I only get five minutes. So I'm going to pause there. Um, but I'm thankful to the party for even having this conversation and thankful, honestly, to live in a county where um, a county commission board will invest millions in this work. Um, that says a lot about where we live and where we work. Hey, Derek, before you before you leave, I, I want to uh, introduce Roger. So I want you to just frame you live for us and then let Mr. Roper do as well. I don't want to steal all of Roger's thunder, but we work together. So We Live is a program where we had a young person was shot that we knew as a, at a young age, and um, we wanted to do something different. And he was in the hospital, and we knew he was capable of retaliation. We knew he had access to weapons. Um, and we had learned of a group out of Detroit called D Live. Detroit Life is valuable every day. And what they would do is take individuals who have been violently injured, train them, pay them, and teach them how to go in the hospitals and start to deal with the violence before that young person got out and picked up the weapon. You can think about U of M and Trinity Health. We have some great doctors who can work miracles and save lives and physically patch people up and send them on their way. But nobody is really dealing with the emotional trauma, fear, and anger that um, is, the, is the cycle of retaliation. As the sheriff said, 80, 80 to 85% of our shootings in the county are retaliatory. That means if I'm in, injured, the likelihood of me retaliating is through the roof. What if, before that person even gets out of the hospital, somebody can put their hands on them and help them start to deal with that anger and that trauma and that grief? And it's a perfect segue, because I don't know of anybody else better to share that story than Mr. Roger Roper. I Everybody, my name is Roger Roper. I'm um, running. Uh, we can't uh, hear over here. Oh, yeah. Hi, is my microphone on? Oh, okay. Can can you hear me now? You still can't hear me. Right, right. You have to speak up. The mic is just for the Zoom, but oh. for them, for everybody else, to hear can you, you hear me now? <laughs> there you go. You can hear me now. <laughs> Okay, my name is Roger Roper. I'm in a program called We Live. We Live is Washington is valuable. I mean, Washington, Washington every life embraces life is valuable every day. You must excuse me. This is my first time. A little nervous here. <laughs> um, Washington is valuable every day. Embraces life is valuable every day. Um, what I do is I go into hospitals and I talk to people who have been um, shot, stabbed, or violently injured of some kind in the community. And we, we know that eight out of 10 violent injuries are because of somebody saying, oh, you did this to my cousin or my nephew or someone and I want to get back at you. You know, it's mostly reta retaliatory like the sheriff and Derek said. So when I go into the hospital, I go in there and I try to get them to trust me and um, realize that I'm there only to help. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. yeah. And I'm only there to help and try to help with resources and get them safety because nine times out of 10, if you're shot in the community, going back to that community, you're going to want to be safe, if the, especially if the same people who shot you are still in that community. So we try to either get them out of the community or make sure they're safe in some way, especially if they don't want to tell on the person who shot at them or stabbed them or whatever the case is. And every time I go into the hospital, the, the victim or the survivor is in there upset and wants to get at the person who did it. And we I, we talk and we try to get things to where they're first calm and trust that I'm not there to be a cop or anything. I don't want to know anything about their cases or anything like that. I'm only there for resources and to help. Um, Washington, I mean, we are, we try to bring in highly trained people like the sheriff said, they're training us. I, have, I don't think there's a training that they have seen that they don't want me to go through. <laughs> um, but that's fine. I don't, I, I love it. 
uh, I like everything about this job going in there. I know that when I was shot, I wanted the first thing I wanted to do was get even and someone came in there and spoke to me and kind of planted a seed in my head that, you know, they getting even would only put you in prison and you really not getting even if you're in prison. Hey, Roger, I don't mean to interrupt. I want to back up just a little bit. Tell your story as, as to sink as quickly as you can, but because that's the power in, in in you doing what you do. Can you just share that with us, please? Okay. Um, I was shot in the chest twice. Um, twenty years ago, I was going to a store to get a money order, and un- just so happened the money order wasn't working. And I spoke and said how much I had in my pocket. I was a uh, attempted rob a uh, robbery. The guy shot me in my chest twice. I went to the hospital and I was told I wouldn't walk again. So all I thought about was getting even with this guy. And it was a young man who came in there in a wheelchair. um, And he basically told me, hey, man, your life isn't over. You can actually do something with your life. And because my whole thought was I'm just stuck out here in the streets now. It's nothing I'll ever be able to do if I can't walk. And this guy kind of put a put a seed in my head and eventually it worked because I went to school. Um, I got an associate's degree and then I went to Eastern and I'm a couple of months away from a bachelor's degree. The sheriff actually hired me. So the sheriff gave me a chance to prove you know that my worth and that's what i'm here to do prove the sheriff right um i work with the outreach workers uh we like i said we all we we want to uh, build trust with our clients and and just try to get them to not go back out there and do the same thing and get themselves in the worst situation we want to clean up our community by doing this type of thing. And um, I don't want to go past my five <laughs> minutes. So I'm going to give it to Supreme Felons who helps us out a lot. So before we do that, thanks, Roger. So a couple of things really quick. So Roger's part of that whole initiative around hospital-based violence intervention prevention, right? So so that, that piece, right, hospital-based. Um, I would encourage all of you to, to look up. There's an article. So as I talk about, you know, evidence-based, the research is really just starting to get traction around evidence-based, but there's an article called A Credible Messenger, The Role of Violence Intervention Specialists in the Lives of Young Black Male Survivors. And it's a study that was made that this, this, this researcher went down, did some, again, qualitative and quantitative research on the impact of who is the best messenger when somebody's lying in the hospital as a victim of a gunshot wound. I just want to read one little piece. This came from a young man that has, was engaged with a VIS, which is a violence intervention specialist. And what his mindset was, he said, a survival echo, hearing my doctors and my nurse tell me, like, everything will be okay during the time, I was like, y'all don't know how I feel. I don't think everything will be okay. When I was coming in here, the VIS was telling me, I was injured too, I got some more people that's in the program and they're doing fine. Ever since that, I was like, yeah, anything is possible. So again, the doctors had the credibility in the the medical space, right? Maybe physically I might be all right, but we talked about the emotional, the psychological, the trauma associated with being shot. There's nobody that can speak to that better than someone that has not only been shot, but what also goes on in the article is a lot of those folks have gone on and gotten a higher, higher education, right? So they've got the lived experience, now the education, now they're going back and, and, and talking to folks that have been shot. That's the credibility. So I'm just going to segue into our next guest, and I'm just going to say this to everybody. Listen, this stuff can be messy, right? This stuff can be messy because we're pushing the envelope on old paradigms about who should do what and when. We just came through this whole post George Floyd where everybody said the police isn't the answer, the community is the answer. Well, I will argue we're both the answer. You can't have one without the other. You have to have both. So the folks we're going to introduce now, they're not part of the sheriff's office. 
not contracted with the sheriff's office. They're totally separate entity, but let me be really, really clear to you. The work that they're doing is critical to the community wellness and safety we have in Washington County. And if we have, I don't care who it is, doing that kind of work, wherever it is in the community, we're gonna engage with them. Because first off, I wanna know what you're doing and how you're doing it. And then I wanna make sure what you're doing is more harmful than it is helpful. And then when my deputies roll out, and they're in there doing the work, we have to make sure there's some alignment. So let's be really, really clear. This gets a little messy. It's gonna be challenging. Don't work for us, but we fully support the work that is being done. And we're gonna to continue to do that. And the last thing I'll say to you, if we're looking for perfect people to do the work, then the work's not gonna get done. Let's be really clear about that. So the first person I wanna introduce is President of Supreme Fellows, Billy Cole. Billy, you got five. Hello. And thank you for this opportunity, praise God. My name is Billy Cole. I'm president of Supreme Felons Incorporated, which is an organization based specifically out of the community of Washington, specifically the 197198 area code. Our organization represents reentry, juvenile mentorship, senior citizen support, and really, uh, most concern of our members is this community violence intervention. We are born and raised within the Ypsilanti community. Uh, we intertwine specifically through family, friends, and associates. And this work um, is very important to us. It's important to us because we didn't come in to this work uh, looking for any assistance outside of what we were doing as individuals of the community. We decided as returning citizens, the men and women within our organization to say that we had to bring some type of attention, some type of halt to the gun violence within our community. Because the reality of the fact is that most of those that were involved in these serious offense were associated with us and our members in some shape, fashion, or form. Uh, members of Supreme Felons speak of uh, our sauce. Our sauce is simply, we are byproducts of this community. We are boots on the ground of this community. And we take this work serious in terms of the people that's in this room right now. We refuse to let you forget. We refuse to allow you to sweep up under the rug the violence is taking place in our community. We have many events that represent that fact. It's not the light, it's the attention and the knowledge that Supreme Felons will continue to impound into the minds of our community and those within our community. Uh, we're very intentional about what we do, very intentional. Uh, we respect community confidence, and we also respect law enforcement, yet we do not involve ourselves in law enforcement work. We asked members of our community that if you feel you have to call the law, please do not call screen facts. Fact, not fiction, fiction. But uh, as some of the gentlemen uh, spoke of, which was, not conscious to me is that 80% of gun violence in our community is uh, retaliatory. When we started this work, we did not know that. As I said, we were very intentional about saving the lives of those specifically in the 197198 area code. And I'll leave it up to you to see how sincere that daddy is and how direct that daddy is specifically for the 197198 area code. Um, me personally, I'm an individual that actually went to prison for 43 years, 11 months, and 22 days. I left at the age of a month before I turned, a month after I turned 18. And uh, through many years of incarceration, I never thought that I would be right here talking to you, uh, distinguished people today. That's the reality, because the reality is that my world was not this world. 
But even in that environment, uh, uh, it installed in me uh, a responsibility to have with those that came from our community. Washtenaw County is Washtenaw County. Ingram County is Ingram County. Genesee County is Genesee County. I say that in terms because things like that is actually separated uh, while you're incarcerated. So those of us that were actually from this community and saw the seriousness of uh, recidivism rate of those that were coming back into the prison, back out of the prison, and explaining to us the faults or the disadvantages that they were experiencing within our community actually initiated us to actually not seek rehabilitation, but to accept transformation. And we started doing this work while incarcerated. Coming out, I was allowed the opportunity uh, through the Washington County Sheriff's Office uh, to use some of my expertise to work directly in my community. Before the CVI committee even came to the manifest, Supreme Felons was actually doing this work. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be associated with those that have the administrative knowledge and the foresight on how to put this in reality. But the truth of the matter, like I said, we've been very intentional about saving the lives of those within our community. Billy, I'm going to pause you right there. Yes, I, I promised everybody I was going to keep them right around five. Nicely done. So so we're going to, uh, the the vice president of the Supreme Fallings is there, so they actually get, we'll get 10 minutes uh, out of the thing. So, But I want to give opportunity for, for Brian to speak as well, because Brian comes at it from a similar perspective, but a slightly different perspective as well. So Brian. Um, first of all, thank you, Democratic Party of Washington County allow us opportunity to share our experiences actually what Supreme Felons Incorporated is all about and as the president um, I'm his right hand man sometimes best friend depending on who he with. sometimes sometimes, <laughs> sometimes. we're personal um, you know uh, it takes a lot of courage to name an organization the Supreme Felons Incorporated right we thought about calling ourselves the Boy Scouts of America, but we <laughs> found that that name had already been taken. <laughs> but we believe in the same principles of the Boy Scouts of America. We believe in the Universal Direct Declaration of Human Rights. We believe in the Charter of the uh, United Nations. We believe in the Constitution of the United States of America. We believe in the Bill of Rights. We believe in the same things that you do and support and uphold also too. So when you hear our names called Supreme Felons, right? Let me make this clear, we're not felons. Felon is somebody who is actively engaged in his felonious activities. You don't call yourselves or people don't call themselves misdemeanors or silver, uh, silver infractions or, or those stuff. Why do you call us felons? We're not engaging at this time in felonious activity. I'm not trying to um, minimize the violent acts that we committed in the past. I'm just putting it into perspective as who we are today. People concentrate on the felon and don't look at the Supreme. The reason why we call ourselves Supreme is because as Billy just said, we actually engaging in not the rehabilitation, but in the transformation. And we have overcame those obstacles and looked at ourselves that what put us into that time frame at that time to commit those acts that we did. One of the things that I did in while I was incarcerated was I studied the dictionary. And there's a word I came across was called penitentiary. And then when I look at the etymology and the root origin of that word penitentiary comes from penitence to think about why you are in this institution and what this institution is for. And I got to examine myself deeply as to why I had committed some of the crimes that I did and was actively engaged. So therefore I got into what 
Billy was just talking about a transformation. I began to realize that some of the activities and the uh, toxic behavior and things that I did in my community, I was best able to identify and relate with those who were doing the things that I had done in the past. Supreme Felons Incorporated has been engaging in community violence interruption long before you talked about uh, ARPA funding, long before the CVI term became popular. I've been working with Derek for years, working with Ellie before this. One of the things that we did when we talk about community violence interruption because it is a plethora of different things. If you ever go to Park Ridge Park, we declared that a nonviolent zone. And what we did was we had the basketball court completely redone. And as we had the basketball court be completely redone, we realized we needed a softball diamond. I engaged with our then county, excuse me, city council person, Annie Somerville. She was able to get $50,000 from Senator Jeff Irwin so that our community can have a new softball diamond. What does that have to do with a community violence interruption? Mm -hmm. If we give our people a healthy place to, to play, a healthy place for our seniors to live, for our people who can come out and have, then they have a lot better area of serenity and a lot of things of sustainable activities to do. We were engaged in those things a long time ago. Some of the activities that Supreme Fellows Incorporated do. We have an organization that's called Supreme Builders Preparatory Academy. And what we have done, we have taken um, students from the uh, middle school, Ypsilanti Middle School, actually to Eastern Michigan University to actually engage in the builders um, uh, programs out there. We build a relationship with all the trades to get our young men and women engaged into the building trades program. We did that currently right now. We're working with Ellie Savage right now as to uh, getting our young men and women, women quite possibly working at um, Stellantis. We're doing these things. I talked to Ellie a couple years ago about um, starting a, uh, a program so that we can have transportation organizations here in Ypsilanti transport our people from here to Toledo, and now it's from Toledo to uh, Detroit to, to occupy those things. Those are the things that we engage with. Nobody um, seems to actually hear. You only hear some of the negative things that we that that uh, that people perpetuate towards us. Those are the things that we do. We engage with uh, um, a game above right now with um, Eastern Michigan University, where we have taken groups into the suites. In particular, uh, one of our program directors, um, Jeanette Haddon. We've taken them to um, the org to the basketball games with them, and we build a relationship with them so our young men from our community can get engaged in um, engineering programs, building programs, as well as learning how to fly an airplane. Brian, I'm going to stop you right there. Yep. Thank you. So we have some questions that have, have, have come up. Um, they talk about all the stuff that they've done, but there's also the stuff that they don't talk about that's the day-to-day -day grit, right? So there are a couple questions that are associated, associated with that. First one, um, I think, sort of comes to what some of us may be struggling with, what some folks in the community struggle with when they don't understand the entire perspective. It's just, how do we balance the need to leverage the value that formerly justice-involved persons bring to CVI? this work, um, how do we balance that with the need to honor the victims of their past transgress transgressions, right? People get, you know, they both acknowledge they're not perfect. Both of them have been in prison and other folks that have done the work have been in prison. So how do we balance the work that they're doing with their past? That goes to, to anybody on the panel that wants to, 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 to answer it or to talk about it or anybody else. You want to go first? Uh, go for it. I, I'll go for it. Um, again, growing up in a community, and every time I talk about this, it, it starts to bring up these uh, trauma memories. So I was raised across the street from a kid who was my best friend, who had lived there for 10, 15 years with me, and somebody took him from us. I was on a track team with a guy who I would hand the baton to every week, and somebody took him from us. And so I fully do this work because I know what it feels like to be a loved one of someone who was murdered and taken from me. So often, again, that I thought it was normal that everybody knew this. And so to me, doing this work, honestly, um, 
it's great that they get to work and redeem themselves. That is not my focus. My focus is so that another kid does not have to go to school the next day when a friend is not sitting next to them in that desk. So to me, this work is fully about the victims and preventing future victims. I don't know how else to say it other than that's really it. And if there's anything, I keep asking people this, what is the price of a life worth? And in particular, what is the price of a black life in Washtenaw County in Ypsilanti worth? Because that's really what we're talking about. When you see the public health data, we're talking about young black boys primarily in the 197198 area. What is that worth? And if there's anything that would help a family never have to experience what it feels like for one of our officers to go to their house and have to tell them, I'm sorry, your son is never coming home again. If there's anything that we could do to do that, then I think we would be negligent not to do it. And so it really is about the victims, at least at the core of why we started doing this work. Personally, I like to uh, piggyback off exactly what you said, because you basically took the words out of my mouth. Uh, our work does center around the victim and victims. Uh, as some of us were perpetrators of violence. We also have those that's within our organizations that were also victims. But uh, in doing so, we've discovered that we must engage. We must engage with those that's uh, more concentrated on doing these acts of violence. We have to associate and engage uh, what hasn't been told is that uh, a lot of the gun violence in our community was somewhat associated with gang violence. Therefore, in doing so and understanding that as our uh, pinnacle, we decided to engage and bring a better understanding to the work that we do. So in dealing with the lives, we lives on this side of the state, uh, we were able to grasp an understanding of the reality of how the bigger gangs or the bigger cities had association with our city in terms of uh, gang rules, gang laws. And the truth of the matter, they were able to even school us, members of Supreme Felons, on how they maneuver out here uh, in Washington County, in particular, how uh, certain fours and fives were associated with those fours and fives in Wayne County. And uh, the reality is that our kids in our county are actually kids. Those in Wayne County are grown men. They're in their late 20s, 30s, and, and even further. Those were the ones that were actually given direction to our kids in our community. So uh, just recently, we were at a game. We were at a, a, a Lincoln game, and we had members of uh, those um, organizations with us. And they actually taught us the signs and symbols in which our kids in our community communicate. They have changed colors. They have changed the signs in which they communicate with. And this is just one format of understanding what they do. And in terms of understanding and engagement, it was over a year and a half, if I'm not mistaken, Brian, that we actually uh, was able to speak with these people and come to a conclusion that they would not uh, engage in gun violence within our community. And I ask you and, and members of this panel, Think about how many gun violent uh, uh, deaths has been in our community within the last two years, associated directly with gang members. Can you answer that question, Brian? Zero. Zero. So, so, and you, you just a dovetail on that. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I talked about community violence intervention what we're talking about is community violence interruption we get in between the perpetrator and the victim's gun 
Billy talked about that. Our phone, he and our phone ring constantly to deal with violence interruption. We get calls from mothers and grandmothers that the sons are down in the basement suiting up right now with guns. Can y'all come and talk to our children? I feel as though something's getting ready to happen. Matter of fact, something is getting ready to happen. Billy's, he alluded to it a little bit, what he called our sauce. And what our sauce is because we are byproducts of this community. And we understand that those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. And because we are of this community, parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, educators contact us to come in and interrupt violence. So we talk about community violence intervention and community violence interruption. We actually gauge in violence, community violence interruption. And because they know who we are, we actually have people disarmed, putting guns down. We put our lives on the line on a daily basis. Sorry about that. No, Jerry. no, no. So that's a good point because that answered one of the questions we had about how Supreme Felons gets involved, right? Who they help and how they get called. So they get they get direct calls. They don't get calls from us. So we don't we don't dispatch them. They go and they're out there doing the work. Um, the thing I'll, I'll tell you one of the, one of the studies that are going on now is they're talking about they're studying the impact of this of the work. So these violence intervention specialists, uh, there are examples in Chicago where they have been killed actually out in the field doing the work. And now there's studies going on around the trauma that is that they they have from out there in the field doing the work. Now remember, most of these people that have already been traumatized and have perpetrated violence. And then they're back out in the community doing the work. There's trauma involved in that too. So people are starting to get smarter about how this is. And I'll just add one more piece and then uh, I think Justin wants to talk. Uh, if not them, who's going to do that work? Raise your hand if you're willing to go do that work. So, 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 so let's just think about that. Who's going to do that work? Because that work has to be done. It has to be done. Justin. Yeah, I really want to underscore the point that came up earlier that Derek mentioned around that public health data. And if you look at it, you'll see that over the last 11, 12 years, that for the majority of the county, there have been no homicides. And after I got elected, a lot of uh, this has been one of my primary focuses, because as I mentioned before, I live in one of the communities that's particularly affected by gun violence. So when I'm thinking about I'm trying to move this forward, and I don't feel the same urgency from colleagues and others in the community, that public health data really explained to me why, because that's not a thing that they're seeing uh, for their constituents or, or, or their residents. And uh, before the Board of Commissioners really got involved in this work, one of the things I think that helped really bring it home for everyone else is two years ago or so we were still able to do our board meetings online. Um, so we were doing, so I'll do that from one of the rooms of my house. I'm doing that. And then um, a shooting occurred down the street from my house. Uh, so I live on the same street that Sugarbrook Park is on. And that has been the site for a lot of shootings uh, over the years. So I had to step away from the, like leave the, the meeting. And, and then deputies came by my house because that they typically do when there's a shooting on my street. Uh, and then had to come back. And I think there, that really sold it to the other commissioner that this is a really serious issue in our county. Uh, it might not be all across the county, but it's heavily localized in certain areas. And it's been mentioned before that 85% or so of the shootings are retaliatory in nature. That's how we know we can prevent it. And I'd add to that too, that in our county, it's largely, it's a lot of kids that are engaged in that. And the, the rec center, rec and community center was brought up earlier, when we're thinking about how do we invest and change lives, and there's such a, I have such a huge focus and other commissioners have such a huge focus on making sure that we finally get the Rec and Community Center to the finish line, it's because it will save lives. There are a lot of kids in my neighborhood that uh, that my wife and I will play games with them because they don't have anything to do. So they'll just come to our house. It's like, what are, what are we gonna do? We have to do something with these kids. Uh, we need some more positive things for, for our kids to be involved with. Uh, I've been to funerals for kids in my neighborhood that have been killed by gun violence. I have to talk to a lot of families. It's, it's really distressing. And for the people in this room now, I, I'm hopeful that as a, from this conversation, you'll really be able to put more of that focus and, and think about Washtenaw County does experience these challenges, even if they're not in your own neighborhood. 
And I'm hopeful that you'll be able to support a lot of the initiatives that we're trying to do to address these issues. To the point, I, I'm confident that we're going to get to the finish line on the East Side Recreation Community Center. Uh, to say, watch our county board of commissioners have allocated seven million dollars to that. Our park and rec department about six million, and Congresswoman Dingle was about to get, was able to get us about three. So we're about fifteen or so million away um, from the cost I think to get it built, and I'm confident that we'll get that. Uh, but it's going to take a lot of support. We don't have the support of some of the local governments that should be supportive of it on getting involved. But when you think about recreation and you think about community centers, it's not just a fun place for people to go. Uh, it's literally a place that can save lives. And someone else will say about Supreme Collins. Uh, I can say that shootings in my neighborhood have decreased significantly because of their work. Since investing in their work and then being able to ramp up their work, far fewer shootings. And for me, I benefit from that because I'm in a neighborhood where that's happening, but every time a shooting like that would occur, I would be afraid that's one of the kids that I know in the neighborhood. And that's just, they're like there are real people, real faces to know, and this work is just really critical. And I, I think that the work that they're doing, because it is not easy work, it's, it's dangerous work, and I, you know, there are loud voices in the community that want us to, to turn against that kind of work, and that's not what we're doing. Here. So, Commissioner Hodge, so, so thank you for your leadership on this. And I'll just bring out again, so this is why I think the Democratic Party is the, is the party, right? Because you, you, know, you look across our, our county board, there's representation in different perspectives on that. And without that, you don't have that perspective, making decisions about how you invest in community. So I appreciate your leadership on that. For, for our prosecutor, I think this is appropriate for the prosecutor. Can you discuss the relationship between domestic violence and other community violence that we, 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 saw, we see? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So domestic violence uh, is, just broadly speaking, is one of the biggest predictors of uh, a potential homicide, right? If a domestic violence incident occurs and there is a gun present in that situation, it increases the risk of homicide by uh, 500%. So that's one thing. But the other thing is that domestic violence, particularly in a family context, has significant downstream effects on kids that may be exposed to it, right? Uh, and the trauma that they experience when they're in a household where domestic violence is going on. Um, it's, it's it, it, you know, just yesterday, actually, I, I, I was having a meeting with some, some researchers and these numbers actually blew me away with the, some of the preliminary numbers about the percentage of kids that have been involved in like child protective services uh, uh, proceedings, uh, which is often associated with domestic violence, uh, that later ended up in the juvenile delinquency system. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, this preliminary numbers, but what I will say is the absolute majority and a significant majority of the kids that are facing juvenile delinquency charges, right? These are the kids that are picking up guns, potentially shooting them at each other, as well as doing a whole bunch of other stuff that's not at that level. The majority, the absolute majority and a significant majority had previous contact with the system through Child Protective Services, which bringing it back to domestic violence, that is one of the key things that, that, that may get on that radar. So to talk about domestic violence, we, we, we've got to focus on domestic violence as an immediate predictor of homicide, particularly where there's a gun present. And that, by the way, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kerry talked about this before on the legislative side of things, is why that extreme risk protection order uh, bill is going to be so absolutely crucial in giving, uh, giving everybody another tool to get guns out of the, uh, a place where domestic violence may be going on. We've also got to be focused on its impact on the children that may be seeing, may be experiencing that, and are traumatized by that. Because uh, you know those are the kids, even if they're three, four, five years old, right? Who are seeing down the line, 15, 16, 17 years old, because of that trauma, acting out in a way, and sometimes acting out in a way that leads to violence. So yes, we got to get at the root of it, which is that domestic violence is in the first place, right? But then also, uh, you know, appreciating that these are traumatized young people and to, to, to what's been said, giving them, you know, not just, a, a, you know, a mechanism to address that trauma, right, but also something more positive because a lot of these kids, 
that are engaged in this stuff. They've lived really, really hard lives. You know, I mean, the, the, the rec center point, uh, some of the st stuff that Brian was talking about, giving them an opportunity, giving them a pathway forward. Like that's the other side of this. It's not just about getting in between uh, the would-be victim and, and the would-be shooter. It's also about getting that, the, the positive off-ramp to say, this is what's possible. This is what you can, you can hope for. I realize I went beyond the scope of the domestic violence question, but all this goes together. All this really ties together. No, Mr. Prosecutor, I think your, your points are well taken, right? You know, our, our, our desire is to get as far, far upstream as possible, right? So even if it gets to the point where um, Roger's got to do work or Billy or Brian's got to do work, that's still too late, right? That's still too late. So part of what the what 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 Ellie's talking about, how how much farther we can get on street. And in Washington County, you know, there's a pivot now to focus on youth. We're talking about that youth, a youth a youth center, not the rec center, but a youth center to help in regards to behavioral health disorder and the trauma that goes along with that. So the county is looking to invest in that space because we know if we're gonna break the cycle, interrupt, intervene, whatever we're gonna do, we have to start with our young folks as, as early as possible. So thanks, Mr. Prosecutor. Roger, I have a uh, we have a question. For you, is this how do you determine who to visit at the hospital? Uh, and is there a positive story that you can share? Uh, I, have a few. I have a few positive stories. Um, we normally go through referrals in the hospital. Um, the uh, father, Joshua, normally calls us and tells us that someone has been shot or stabbing and we stabbed and we go up there that way um a positive story i can tell you one um, of recently of a girl who was shot and there called me and told me that the girl is up there going off on all of the nurses <laughs> and talking about how she wants to get back at the person who shot her and the girl who was with the person who shot her so I know all about going off on the nurses and stuff at the hospital after you got shot. And I knew what it was all about. It was just total anger and just being up there and mad that you up there, one, and two, that you, you've gotten shot. So when I went up there, I talked to her. At first I listened because she had a lot to say <laughs> when I got there. So of course I listened and then I told her a little bit about my story. And from that point, me and her just talked and we talked and we gave, we, we gave each other the number. And of course I went through my uh, signing her up for We Live and all that. And ever since then, the girl has been really calm. She's um, looking for a job. She has not talked about shooting or stabbing anyone and um i think it's going really well right now i don't think i don't foresee any problems with this with this young lady as long as we can keep her busy and away from the life that she had before she got shot and stabbed thank you roger uh so there are a couple questions i'm going to combine together um so bear with me. So the first part, is, is there a role in CVI for community members that aren't elected or appointed officials that aren't formally just as involved? Is there a role for folks in that space? And let me add a few more questions that came along with this. I'm gonna read them just as they're written. How can a white woman work to engage with traumatized, marginalized communities? What steps would prove effective to engage these communities? And then the last piece is in today's environment, um, we often think about police and community. Well, you know what? Let me just park with those for, with those first two. So, is there a role for community members that aren't elected, appointed, or formally just involved? And how can folks that don't come from the communities that we normally think about, when we think about uh, a community that that may be less safe or less well than what we want? How how can folks get involved? Can Can I address that first? Um... First of all, I have to ask that person, why did they feel it was necessary to address themselves as a white woman? That wasn't even necessary to, obviously, um, you recognize the difference in the culture. 
That's I'll a, just say this, bro. I think oftentimes folks, it's really meant to be because I don't, I, I'm not, I haven't lived what you live. So it's yeah, an exactly. acknowledgement of not right. I got you. you. Right. Okay. Yeah, I was going down there. So that was the first thing I've, because I've, because I've been asked those questions on numerous occasions. The first thing to do is come in and get to know the culture, come in and get to know our community, come in and get to know our people first, getting to know them first before you decide to say, I'm here to help. And once you get that, then you find out that you do have a lot of things to offer and very valuable. But when you come in saying that I am here to help, you don't know, and then you start to receive a lot of backlash from the people that you're trying to help and organize because our com each community is different. They are. And so that will be my suggestion first, spend some time. And time sometimes is more than just a six month period of time. You need to spend sometimes two to three years in here just to get to know who people are and engage. That would be the first thing. You have a lot of value to that. Just want to say that. Thanks, Brian. I'll just give a couple of real examples as well. I would say read the 14 point plan, read the book Bleeding Out. Uh, um, understand what the issue really is. Uh, in the plan, there are lots of things that, uh, some of the things are about policing, right? Because accountability is a part of the ecosystem of how you deal with this. Um, some of it is hospital-based, what Roper does. Some of it is street-based, what uh, Supreme Felons does. So there are lots of different pieces. And some of them, you don't have to be elected official to make sure you come to the Board of Commissioners so they understand how important it is to continue to push in that community center. Um, one of the young people said to us in one of our meetings, how come when somebody is on the bike and they get hit, run over at the intersection and they die, we put the ghost bike there, if you've seen them at the intersection, and nobody ever moves it, stays there forever. They even cut the lawn around it. How come when one of our friends gets shot in the street, we do the vigil the next week, maybe even the next day sometimes, the teddy bears, the crosses, the balloons are gone the next day. And the question is mentioned, someone who's trauma informed. What that says to us in our community is, we aren't treating people equally, right? A kid at a school can have a medical emergency and pass away in that school building and we send all the social workers, therapists and wrap around that student body and we should. When the same school has someone who's murdered in the streets, we don't do any of that. That is sending messages to our kids. And so no matter where you come from or who you are, like being able to see those differences and then be able to push from the seat that you are in, like why this is so important. And I will just say that, because um, they said it in the question, you know, you know, being a white woman who is not from this area, I'll just have, I gotta give credence to Sue Shink, who will say in our meetings, right. she's like, I don't get this work. This is not my life. But now that she is at the state, She's still having these conversations around community violence because she was willing to listen and to learn from the right. Billy Coles, the Ropers, and the Bryans of the world. And so to me, I think um, we all have a role to play in this. And when you look at those 14 points, it isn't just about being elected or being one of the interveners. There are so many other things in there about what we could be doing as a community um, that has nothing to do with uh, the folks who are on the panel right now. And I think that's a really important question. And I really encourage people to read that report. Thank you. Uh, Chair? Yeah, I'll be real quick with it. Mm -hmm. So just to give you a perspective from an elected official, I would say it shouldn't take courage to support work like this, but I think for many elected officials, it does. Yes, it does. And just for context, like Derek said, you know, come uh, to a board meeting and give public comment and say, hey, this work is really important and I'm glad you're investing in it. Because we have people that come and speak against this work pretty regularly. Uh, I expect we'll probably get some people on Wednesday come and speak against this work. Uh, it, it was, and it has gotten so bad that the sheriff had to issue a press release to defend this work. We were regularly having to defend this work um, from naysayers in the community. And I'll tell you one thing, politicians don't like having negative news articles written about them. You know, that has been happening, right? So I would say uh, the low hanging fruit from everybody here is tell your elected officials this work is important and you support it. Yes. Where do we find the 14 point plan? What's the easiest access there? to that? So um, the community violence intervention. The question was, where do we find the 14 point plan? The CVIT community violence intervention team is a community based group made up of multiple organizations. One of them is Washington, my brother's keeper. So they have agreed to house all the documentation for CVIT there. So if you go to Washington, MBK uh, slash CVIT, uh, you'll see the plan. Um, I do want to give a shameless plug on May 1st. We're doing the first CVIT Spring Summit right here in Washington. 
Thanks to Washington Community College for donating the space and the Sheriff's Office for funding most of it. Some of the nation's premier leaders in this space are going to be there. Thomas App, the author of Bleeding Out, is going to be the keynote. Um, folks from all over the country will be there teaching sessions, and so it's free. Um, so we really wanted to make sure our entire community could come. There are flyers in the back, um, but that flyer is also at that Washington MBK slash CVIT. So on May 1st, we're going to have a... I'm sorry. WashingtonMBK.org slash CVIT. Thank you, sir. Um, but that's going to be a really important conversation that expands beyond what we're doing here today. So, you know, before we got like a minute to go, before we acknowledge the panel, let's just, just say a couple of things. So this work has really just begun, right? Uh, and it's going to require continuing investment, not just of dollars, but of people and, and our commitment to doing this in a uncomfortable for some and messy space. But I don't think we reached this, the, the, the desired outcome of being a, a well and safe community without doing this work. Now, we've talked about 197198, but let's be really, really clear. This type of stuff doesn't know jurisdictional boundaries. The only people who know jurisdictional boundaries are elected folks or appointed folks. Just because you live in one space and you haven't been touched by it doesn't mean you can't be touched by it because you have to traverse the county. And remember, as healthy and as safe as the eastern part of Washington County is, that was what boosts the larger county. So this investment is for all of us. Uh, some of the work that's being done is directly funded by the public safety mental health knowledge, those direct dollars. So as we think about how does that investment been turned around, that investment has been turned around into this work, right? Especially the We Live work and some of the some of the other work, the Supreme Felon investment came from the county in terms of their recognition of it. And to Justin's part, it took courage because some folks, although we talk about all this in this progressive space in Washington County, oftentimes we lean left and go right in some of our rhetoric. <laughs> Let's be really honest about it. And this might be uncomfortable for some folks. And I'm just add this last piece, especially when we start talking about black folks. So let's just keep it real. A lot of the attacks that have happened have been around black folks in elected and appointed positions. I ain't seen nobody else. Maybe it's because it's the black folks that are leaning into this. But let's be really, really clear. This is about all of us doing the work that is the right work. So can we applaud the panel for a great discussion? <laughs> and to the WBCP for allowing all of us to have the space to engage in this discussion, hopefully it continues. Thank you. I'll turn it back over. Yeah. I am, I, I think I'm speaking for most people in this room to say I'm so moved and impressed by the panel. Sheriff Clayton, my gosh, the incredible, incredible work. Thank you so much. Just one more time. I also want to, again, I'm not Sheriff Clayton anymore. Um, <laughs> go to the Lewis Nagel concert, please. It's WashingtonDems.org. Washington You'll find it. And then the and then the celebration of the Elliot Larson, uh, passage of the Elliot Larson Act on Tuesday in Carytown. Um, I think that's all I've got for you. Oh, and thank you. Yes, the May 1st Summit. Sorry. There are flyers on the table out there. That's so cool that it's happening right here and we can all be part of it. Um, so that's it. Anything, anybody? Thank you. Thanks for being here.